Hi, this is Shambhavi. Welcome to my weekly podcast about spirituality, love, death, devotion, and waking up while living in a messy world. The Satsang with Shambhavi podcast is recorded live each week with students of our nonprofit community, Jayakula. For more information and to find out about attending a satsang, visit jayakula.org. Thanks for listening. Much love to you, wherever and however you are. Nice to see everybody. So I thought I would start tonight by elaborating a little bit on what has been said in the morning worship practice when we are first entering the heart space and I give the instruction to forget yourself, to forget who you are, to forget your personality and your convictions and your identities and your histories and all of that and just rest. So in the teachings of Trika, there's something called samavesha, which means immersion in the self. And that's a very important word in Trika because it points toward something really fundamental, which is that we are not taking up a position of a watcher or an observer, but we are being immersed in that living presence and simply in the freshness of that, responding spontaneously with attitude of improvisation. So this is quite, quite different from what people get taught oftentimes what they're taught before they come to a teaching like this. And it's very hard to give up the habit of using your mind as an observational, witnessing kind of an analyzing tool, rather than just relaxing and letting experience come to you directly from living presence, from wisdom, living wisdom. In Dzogchen, there's an idea of natural contemplation, which is somewhat similar. So in the meditation traditions I've studied in, including Dzogchen and Kagyu and Nigma traditions, the instruction, once you get into the less formful kinds of meditation practices, is something like you have to lose the watcher and enter into direct experience, which is called contemplation rather than meditation. So these ideas of natural contemplation and samavesha are not identical, but they are both pointing toward the same thing. So in those traditions where I've studied mostly meditation, but some other things too, there's a teaching that meditation is basically everything that helps you to enter into a natural state of contemplation. Many people think, oh, I'm meditating, I'm doing it, whatever it is. This is the bomb, you know, meditation, I'm doing it. But meditation is really more a collection of techniques, some very, very subtle attitudes that we adopt in order to actually enter into non-meditating. <laughs> so, for instance, one of my most beloved teachers, Lama Wangdor, said that meditation is without a speck of meditating. And what he was trying to point to was that there's something that these techniques, even the most subtle of those techniques, the techniques that are really just like adopting an orientation towards something, are all in some respect in the way. <laughs> They're leading us towards something, but at some point we have to jump off and just relax and let whatever that is, as Ma called it, that, meet us. So in both traditions, there's this idea of this immediacy and freshness, immersion, naturalness, that is what our practices are helping us, encouraging us to jump into or just let ourselves be taken by. So when we are being in what's called the natural state, being very relaxed, we don't remember who we are. We are not holding on to concepts of who we are. We're not defending our positions. We're not taking positions over and over and over again as a kind of way of fashioning a sense of ourselves for ourselves and for other people. We're not presenting anything. We may spontaneously emit opinions about things or take very strong actions, 
but we're not holding on to those things, right? They come and they go as appropriate to whatever moment we happen to be in, whatever mandala of circumstances we happen to find ourselves in. So forgetting ourselves is a first step toward entering into that experience of immersion. As long as we're holding on to things that are part of our identity formation, our self-construct, then to whatever extent we're holding on to those things and putting energy into maintaining them, because if you've been coming to morning practice, you realize that you can go into the heart space and try to rest, but if you don't let go of all that stuff, rest is quite superficial, right? You're still putting a lot of energy elsewhere instead of just in that immediacy, that sense of freshness that is arising there. So this is what forgetting the self is all about. And of course, in Trika, it is said that Lord Shiva, meaning all of reality, is in a state of natural contemplation or samavesha or sahaja, naturalness. And so when we're entering into this, we are being in the natural state. We are being in our real nature. That's what we're doing. This is the kind of language that's used in Trika as well as Dzogchen, although they're not identical. There's sort of a different set of affect terms that are used in these different traditions. And Trika is just more explicitly devotional. So that's one very simple way of putting it. I was thinking about my relationship with Nam Kai Norbu, my Zogchen teacher today, and a lot of our relationship took place in dreams. And in dreams he expressed some annoyance and sadness that I wasn't being in his tradition in this lifetime. And I kept saying, yeah, I know, but now I'm doing this other thing. And, <laughs> and I think it's really because of that. It's because of the way that, that devotion in the heart is front and center. And that's really where I want to be. And it's not that there's not devotion in Dzogchen lineages and traditions. It's just, it's not as much the main event, which it is for me. So I wanted to read you something. This is from a South Indian Agama, which is kind of the equivalent of a Tantra. And this is a little bit similar to what I've been saying, and now you'll maybe understand it more. This is from the Devika Lotara, as I said, a South Indian Agama. Disconnect from all relations to the country, to status, caste, duties, and think constantly about your own natural state. So, of course, this is the translation. We don't really want to be thinking about our natural state. We want to just be relaxing and experiencing it. So just chalk that up to somebody's bad intercession in the translation. Having abandoned all ideas about the country, caste, community, ashram. Remember Ma always said, I don't care about ashrams. You don't have to build ashrams. But if you want to, fine, go ahead. Knock yourselves out. Having abandoned all ideas about the country, caste, community, ashram, and related issues, stick to and practice always meditation on the Atman, your own natural state. So this is actually quite wonderful because so often the word Atman is mistranslated as soul. And then, of course, when people who have been conditioned by the Abrahamic traditions get a hold of that, they immediately assume it means the same thing, like some little homunculus, round, glowy thing inside of you that's going to float around from lifetime to lifetime. <laughs> but here, whoever wrote this is really getting much closer to what Atman just means, the natural state, the self-aware natural state. In other words, the self of all, the self of everything. It is your natural state, but it doesn't belong to you. And, of course, we've been practicing with that in the morning with trying to start to recognize that whatever we're experiencing in the heart space is also out here. And this is a beautiful aspect of Trika practice where we're practicing with sandhis both inside the body and out. And they have Sanskrit names, but it's not really important. In any case, that's a very kind of traditional practice from this type of tradition. 
where we're learning to recognize that the heart is everywhere, right? That wisdom is manifesting everywhere, not just within us. So that's just a little bit of getting deeper with this forgetting yourself. Jean Levy? Yeah, Avi. Can I can I check in with you about the relationship between visualization practice and experiencing the natural state? Sure. When I sit with you in morning practice, and, and this has been going on for years with visualizations, I mean, you know me, I've had a very, very challenging time with visualization just because I'm so in my head. Where I am right now, and I don't know if this is correct, but it feels like the path that this is leading me to is using the visualization as a bridge to get to actual experience where I'm actually in that visualization and and feeling it rather than thinking about it or watching it. Am I on the right track? Well, don't use it. Just feel it. Can you just skip over the using it part where you're the director and just feel it? So this gets to the whole idea of transmission because... Transmission is given in many, many different ways. And one of the ways is through visual objects, including some of the objects that are in the meditation that we do each morning. So that visualization, whether or not you can fully visualize it, is actually communicating to you. So don't you use it. Let it use you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I know that's hard. Okay. Try not to keep thinking All right. while I'm talking. <laughs> good. Slap yourself because I, I can't throw anything at you. Yeah, good. So it is transmitting to you the knowledge of your real nature in many, many different ways. So just relax and see what comes to you. The inability to visualize it all or well is so, so, so common. I think it's more common than not. I don't really know why it is. A friend of mine hypothesized that it was because looking at saturated colors on computer screens was burning out our ability to visualize. I don't know if that's true. It sounds plausible. Or maybe it's because we're just so used to aggressing with our thinking that we can't stop doing that long enough to have an image arise. But in any case, just do your best. The most important thing is that you're experiencing what that scene is revealing to you experientially. I don't know that I am better at visualizing than I was five years ago. But what I do know is that I am more relaxed about just trying it and trying to be with it and not worrying so much about it. That sounds wonderful. Good result. But it is the ultimate path to feel it in a more physical, embodied way than to just think about it or to picture it. Well, see, you're still trying to figure out what you should be getting and what you should be feeling. If you're having a conversation with somebody at a party and you're standing in front of them and you're saying, like, so when I'm standing here talking to you, am I supposed to be feeling you? <laughs> physically or do you want me to be listening to you this way and hearing what you're saying in a more intellectual way could you please let me know what I'm supposed to be doing in this conversation with what you are telling me you know it's ludicrous I think that's cute like I think that's (laughs) (laughs) you would like that briefly briefly For all of us neurodiverse types, that would be the kind of conversations that we Yeah. Have. So there's a reason why all of existence is personified as something like Lord Shiva or Durga or Ganesha or Lalita Tripura Sundari. There's a reason why there's a personification of all of existence and why all of existence is called the Supreme Self. Because we are reflections of the nature of that self. And that self is self-aware and like a super person in a sense. So everything that we're experiencing here is communicative, potentially, if our senses were open enough to receive that communication. 
And when we're doing these practices in the morning and other practices, we're practicing to open our senses and get in the conversation. Let's say you were talking to a really alluring woman at a party, someone you were really attracted to. You're just sitting there letting it all wash over you, right? That's what you should be doing with the visualization. It's like a beautiful, alluring woman for you. Parentheses, he slash him. <laughs> yeah, I'm being heteronormative just for you. Out of my infinite mercy, I'm meeting you where you live. <laughs> Thank you.